This is the Digging for Truth podcast, presented by the Associates for Biblical Research, demonstrating the historical reliability of the Bible through archaeological and biblical research. For many people, even some professing Christians, the account of Noah's Ark is a mythical story, or maybe just a narrative that's supposed to share some underlying truths, but the events never actually occurred, or maybe they did, but it was just a localized flood. And some of the objections have to do with the Ark itself. Others take the narrative more seriously. Ministries like ABR, the Institute for Creation Research, and also Answers in Genesis. In 2016, to help people visualize what the Bible says about the Ark and its dimensions and how it could have all worked, Answers in Genesis actually built a full-scale replica of the Ark as a museum that people can visit. And it certainly made a lot of headlines. After years of anticipation and construction, the Ark Encounter is now officially open in northern Kentucky. The park in Williamstown features a life-size replica of Noah's Ark, and it's expected to bring at least a couple of millions of visitors in each year. WKYT's Mark Barber is live in Grant County with reaction from supporters and critics. Visitors aren't just filing in two by two, they are flooding in by the thousands to see this massive ark that is seven stories tall and nearly two football fields long. It is a life-size replica of Noah's Ark, built following the same measurements in Genesis 6. Crowds started lining up early this morning to weave their way through the gargantuan attraction that was built to teach a biblical worldview. The ark is also drawing in protesters who are lining the exit ramp on I-75. The critics do not think the $100 million religious theme park should be receiving $18 million in tax breaks because they say it celebrates fiction, not fact. Others, however, disagree. Live in Williamstown, Mark Barber, WKYT. Tim Chafee is the content manager of the Ark Encounter there in Kentucky, and he and Henry got to talk about all things related to Noah's Ark, the biblical narrative, and how they've tried to bring that to life for people to see. So I'll pass it off to Henry. Tim, we welcome you to Digging for Truth. Thanks for being with us. Henry, thanks so much. It's great to be with you. Yeah. Um, it's, uh, it's just a, what a, gr- a great time to be alive, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Is is The Lord is good. We'll be talking about the Ark Encounter. and But before we get to that, let's just talk briefly about what you do. Let's set the stage for our audience, the Ark Encounter, and what you do there at Answers in Genesis. Maybe you give a quick blurb on that. Yeah, you mentioned that I'm the content manager, and that's for the attractions division of Answers in Genesis, so that's the the Creation Museum and the Ark Encounter. So I'm responsible for developing the content that people will will engage with as they go through the exhibits at both places. Uh, so that can be the the writing for the signage, that can be the maybe the audio or video scripts that they might see in some of the things. And it's not like a, a one-man team. I've got an assistant who is really an expert on the animals, and so I got to give him all of the, uh, everything having to do with the animals, let him focus on that. And I focused on just about everything else related to the ark. And then we rely on our team of experts. You know, when it came to geology, I'm not a geologist at all. And I don't play one on TV. Um, <laughs> <laughs> to me, when I look at all those rock layers, they're rocks. I couldn't tell you the difference between a whole bunch of them. Yes. Uh, but we have a geologist on staff and I was able to consult with him and uh, the same thing in other areas as well, you know, that are outside of my area of expertise. I got to consult with them and uh, everything got reviewed by experts as well. So uh, we're making sure that we're uh, teaching God's word accurately, faithfully, and uh, also teaching the science and history accurately as well. Well, it's excellent. We want to encourage folks to visit the Ark Encounter. My family and I did a couple of years ago, and it was an excellent experience. You could see the work that Tim and his staff and his, his colleagues have put into it. Now, Tim, before we go to the Ark, we do need to lay a little bit of foundational discussion about the narrative itself, the flood narrative, because we want to talk about because that's our foundation. It's the Word of God and why we, we believe, for example, why it's a global flood. So let's just talk about some of the features in the narrative. Maybe you could start with a, a few key things about the, the flood narrative that point to that conclusion. Yeah, I think when you begin in Genesis chapter 6, God starts telling us how wicked that world is. And it gets to the point where, you know, the whole world is filled with violence through them, that the thought, every intent of the thoughts of man's heart was only evil continually. And there's just this overwhelming sense of how wicked the whole world is other than Noah who found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And it gets to the point where God was grieved that he had made man and he's going to destroy them or wipe them off the face of the earth. And so when you start reading the flood account, 13 times in that account, you read that 
all flesh was destroyed. So it uses that phrase, all flesh, 13 times, all in whose nostrils was the breath of life. Every creature on the land died over and over again. You see this, that it's emphasized that it was all flesh. Well, I don't think that there's any hermeneutical justification to say, well, I think when he's stressing all so many times, it means really just the, the stuff in that region. Um, yeah. which is the alternative view. You know, people will say, well, it was just describing a, a regional flood or a local flood, and uh, it was still devastating. But uh, th there's so many problems with that because as you uh, if you look at what else it talks about, it says all the high hills under the whole heaven were covered as the waters kept rising and rising. Well, once all the high hills are covered under the whole of heaven, there's nothing to hold the water back, meaning it's going to just continue to spread around the globe. Uh, you have the the animals that were brought on board the ark. Um, if if it's just a regional flood, don't you think the animals could have just moved out of the area? I mean, would he even have to bother to bring them along? Um, that's particularly true about the the flying creatures. The Bible's very clear. Noah had to bring the flying creatures, and uh, yet if it's a local flood, they can they can just fly out of it. There's no point in bringing the flying creatures, and yet it's yes. very clear he had to bring. Uh, seven or seven pairs of each of the flying creatures, which I think we'll talk about that uh, in a little bit as well. Uh, there is the New Testament tells us that only eight people survived the flood, which is exactly what Genesis tells us, Noah and his wife, uh, their three sons and their sons' wives. Uh, Jesus compared the, the judgment at his return to the judgment of the flood. So if the flood judgment was just a regional or local judgment, maybe that's what Jesus has in mind when he comes back. Maybe it's just going to be a, a local judgment as well. Um, I think to me, one of the most important reasons to understand that it was a worldwide flood is the rainbow. You know, God puts this yeah. in the sky and says, this is a, a symbol of my promise, my covenant with you that I will never again. And he says it three times in there, never again, never again, never again, destroy the earth with a flood like this. Well, if that was a local flood or a regional flood, then every single time we see a rainbow, every single time there's a local or a regional flood today, God lied. And yet the Bible is very clear that that's impossible. God yes. cannot. Yeah, yeah, that, that's good. That's a good survey, Tim, of, of those features in the text. And, you know, you really, I feel, I've always felt all along since the days of my, when I was first converted in my late 20s, when you read that narrative, the force of it just comes upon you. You have to make a decision as to whether or not you're going to believe what the text says. And then the affirmation, like you said, of the New Testament authors as well. Second, uh, Second Peter is another example. Maybe you could uh, talk about that briefly. Yeah, in Second Peter, uh, in chapter 3, Peter is talking about Christ's return, and he's talking about how there's going to, you know, there's going to be scoffers in those days, and they're going to they're going to hold to this philosophy that all things continue as they were since the beginning, and they're, they're going to mock the idea that Christ will return. And Peter says that they deliberately overlook this fact. The heavens existed long ago, and the earth was formed out of water and through water by the Word of God. And then he says, and by means of these, the world that then existed was deluged with water and perished. That world died. It's not talking about just a region of the world. It's, Peter's talking about that whole, the, the globe itself, the whole entire world perished. That original uh, creative world perished in the flood. And then it's going to happen again. There's a coming judgment. This time it's by fire. In the beginning, in the, the flood, Noah's flood, God provided a means of physical safety in the ark for Noah and his family. Yes. You know, they weren't saved eternally because they walked in the door of the ark, but they were spared from the physical consequences of the flood. And that's a great picture of the of what Christ has done for us. And that is through this coming judgment that is going to be by fire this time. Uh, God has provided a means of eternal salvation through his son, Jesus Christ. Yeah, that, uh, eight saved from the flood, millions and millions saved through Christ. And that's that's a picture of God's grace. Now, Tim, we laid the foundation uh, a little bit, you know, just briefly. Obviously, we couldn't give a full defense of why the flood was universal. Let's move the discussion down to the ark itself. I guess the thing to start with is how big was it? Yeah, well, I think that's a, uh, a great segue because that's another argument for the fact that this is a worldwide flood. If it was just a little tiny vessel, um, which is all you would need if it was just a, a regional flood. You just need a, a boat that's big enough for your family and maybe a few animals because most animals could get out of the region. Yet the Bible's uh, very clear on how big the ark was. It was uh, 300 cubits long. It was 50 cubits wide and 30 cubits tall. Well, the cubit is this measurement from your elbow to the tip of your finger. And we don't know exactly which cubit Noah would have used. Uh, you know, people will say, well, the common cubit was 18 inches or 17 and a half inches. 
but the, the truth is there are a whole bunch of different measurements for the cubit throughout the ancient Near East. And all of those are coming from a time much later than Noah. So we had to figure out which one are we going to use. And so what we did, uh, if you look at um, in Jerusalem, Hezekiah's tunnel is built on a 17 and a half inch cubit. And so that's one of the shorter uh, cubits within the ancient Near East. So we took that cubit. And then because so many ancient building projects were built on what's called a long cubit mm-hmm. or a royal cubit where you're adding the width of four fingers to it. We took one of the shortest of the regular cubits and then added 2.9 inches to it. So you have a 20.4 inch long cubit, which okay. would be one of the shortest of the long cubits, if that makes sense. Yes. Um, so that gives that means the Ark Encounter that we have down in Williamstown, Kentucky, is 510 feet long and 85 feet wide and 51 feet tall. And, of course, it's sitting up on top of uh, some pillars as well. And then it's got this, this bow fin. So the very top of that structure that you see is over a, just over 100 feet tall. So we're talking, let's just talk about the length for a little bit. So 500 feet for football fans out there, we're talking about uh, this about one and two-thirds football field in length almost, right? I, yeah. mean, I mean, right? Yeah, you're from the you're from Pennsylvania. Your your listeners will get that, but I'm in the Cincinnati area. They don't have any idea what a football field is. Um, <laughs> but I grew up in Green Bay, I, so I know what it is. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. A little love uh, for our fans out there, but everybody knows what 500 feet is. This is no you know life raft with a few uh, animals on it. We're talking about a massive structure that Noah had to build. So so I guess the natural question would be. Was Noah and his sons and probably people they hired, presumably, to build the ark, did they have the ability to construct a, 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 a watercraft of this size? Yeah, that's a great question. And, and I think for you and me as Christians who believe that the Bible is inspired, inerrant, and authoritative, well, it tells us he did. So we have complete confidence that he did. But what happens so often is that we tend to look at that world through if I can say an evolutionized blends, you know, right. the, the way that people have been taught history for the last 150 to 200 years is that ancient man was primitive and we're just getting better and better and better. But what's really happening and, and what we miss because a lot of times we don't account for the flood and we don't account for another event that occurred within a few generations of that, which is the Babel event. You actually had a couple of what, what I call technological resets. So, from the time of Babel, whatever people understood at that time, you're getting at least 70 different people groups that are splitting up and going off to different areas. If I was part of that, I'm probably going to starve. Uh, you know, nobody's going to be hiring a writer at that point. Right. You've got to be able to uh, either grow food or hunt food or, or catch it, you know, fishing, that kind of thing. Uh, you've got to be able to build shelters. And I, I'm not good at the, those things. Uh, so I would have been in trouble. But um, you, you almost lose whatever technology was built up to that point. And then with the, at the time of the flood, you're looking at in at Noah's time period, the, the highest, most likely the highest technological level that they were able to achieve by that point, because you've got at least 1600 years of history up until that point. Right. And how many things could they have uh, learned how to do during that time? And, you know, God tells them, here's the dimensions, you know, here's the size of it. And he gives them a few instructions um, our approach to this was if the Bible doesn't tell us that something was done miraculously, you know, God did everything for him or gave him the whole blueprints, you know, then just assume that God prepared Noah with the ability, the skills to do what he had to do. And that's what we see in our own lives. You know, when God calls us to do something, a lot of times he's been equipping us for that task for years and years and years yeah. before we ever even know. Yeah, Paul would be another, a New Testament analogy. His knowledge of the Old Testament scriptures and his being trained as a Pharisee and all that was a preparation that God used when he converted him to bring the gospel uh-huh. to the world. You know, it's interesting because what you're talking about really here, especially when we get back into the early chapters of Genesis, are paradigm conflicts that grow. So somebody looks at the Noah's Ark and they go, well, people couldn't build a boat back then. End of story. But we're saying that not just the story is correct, but the whole paradigm is different. Yeah, that's exactly right. And just to touch up, touch on that issue of God preparing us, I mean, the same thing was true with me. For, for decades now, I've been fascinated by the pre-flood world and reading as much as I can on that and studying it. I had no idea that I was going to be the person writing all the signs in the Ark Encounter. But yeah. you know who did? The Lord did. The Lord did, yeah. And he was using those things to prepare me to do what I got to do. And it's, it's, I, I, I love it. It's, it's great to be a part of it. Um, but yeah, you're right. It's a, it's a completely different paradigm 
when you're looking at starting from God's word, where you have God making Adam and Eve in the beginning, and Adam lived to 930 years. How much do you think, how much knowledge do you think you could accumulate during that time? And, you know, his, his mind probably operated a lot better than ours does. Uh, you know, we've got, we're suffering from thousands of years worth, worth of the, of, of, of sin. And we don't live as long anymore. We only live, a, you know, maybe a, a ninth or a tenth of what they did. Yes. And it's, it's just a, it's a completely different way of looking at it. If we start from scripture rather than trying to apply our world on top of it, these things, it does make perfect sense what it's telling us. And uh, what, and what I was getting at with that technological reset at the time of the flood, the only technology that survived is whatever was in the ark at that point. Yes. And if you had other people who were working on it, that were helping out with some of the technical details, well, those are lost too. If it wasn't something that Noah and his family brought with them. And so then they're going to have to start over. Uh, so even if they had, uh, you know, different guilds for working with metals or all sorts of other things in the pre-flood world, that all starts over after the flood. You got to find the metals in the ground. And, and yes. so it's going to take a while for, for civilization to restart. Yeah. And, and then it, that makes a great, it starts over again at Babel. Yeah. Yes. Makes a great deal of sense again, but it's a different paradigm. We want people to think about it, about it that way. Let's uh, dig down a little bit further. Let's talk about the, the animals. I guess the first question we can start with is, how did Noah catch the animals? What, what does the text of Scripture say about that? Yeah, you know, the skeptics love that question. You know, they, they joke about it. Do you really think that Noah went all over the world and found all these animals? What if he forgot some? You know, and you get those kind of questions. And I always, whenever I talk about the subject with, with fellow believers, I encourage them, rather than just taking the skeptic's word for it, go back to Scripture. What does the Bible tell us about this? Does, does Noah have to look for the animals? Well, in Genesis 6.20, the Bible tells us he didn't have to because God says of the birds after their kind, of animals after their kind, two of every kind will come to you. So the, the answer is right there. God sent the animals to Noah. He didn't have to go around looking for them. Yes. And, and, and so that brings in another big paradigm question. Now, we didn't plan on talking about this, but it's a natural segue. They got there. Now, the world as it exists now, you've got Australia, you've got Antarctica. How did they get there? But that's a paradigm question, isn't it? Go ahead with that. Yeah, it really is. Because In Genesis 1, when God creates everything in six days, it tells us that all the waters were gathered together in one place, which seems to imply that all of the land would have been together in one place. And when you read Genesis 2, the land that's described there is like nothing else on earth today. And the reason for that is the flood would have changed everything. Uh, we've got presentations on uh, flood geology or the different things, what's called them. Um, catastrophic plate tectonics, the things that would have taken place during the flood is that original pre-flood continent is ripped up and it results in what we know today. Uh, and so the, the reason we have seven continents today is a result of the flood. And so if you have one land mass in the pre-flood world, you don't have to worry about how could animals from different regions get back to where they are. Yes. And so really, again, it's a, it's a different paradigm where you're applying today's world, assuming that it's the same thing as what happened, what it was like before the flood, and then saying, um, well, how could they get there? So again, you're, you're not even taking into account the, the worldwide flood. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. As I understand it, you can, you can correct me if I make sure I get this right, is, okay, the Genesis text I indicates it's all one land mass, and now we don't have one land mass. Well, what's the event in history that happened that was most likely had, ha explains that? The flood. And we know, we can see the continents, how they piece together. We know that India slammed, slammed up against Asia and formed the, the Himalayan mountains. We're just saying it happened on a much faster time scale. But the ideas are sort of similar. Is it, am, I, am I explaining that well or correctly? Yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah. And that's why if, if people would look up uh, CPT, cla catastrophic plate tectonics, there would be explanations that are much better than I could give. I know yes. a guy yes. named Dr. John Baumgartner did some of the initial modeling for this, and um, you know, he's, a, he's a brilliant researcher. And uh, it's it's beyond my level of expertise, I can tell you that, about how all of those things work. But, yeah, that's sure. the model is that it, it was during the flood that we get the – the breakup of that continent and results in pretty much what we see today. There still would have been some shifting after the flood, but yeah, uh, in sure. the first several decades or so. Yeah, but it, but I think the main the main point for our audience who's not familiar with this is we can't take what we observe in the present and assume the past was exactly that way. And when you have a catastrophic event like the flood, it changes the dynamic of everything. And I think that's the main thing, just to get us thinking that way, even if even if we don't know the science. Yeah, well, that's exactly what Second Peter three tells us, isn't it? 
Yes. You know, that they, they deny the creation, they deny the flood, they mock the return of Christ. And their philosophy is that the way things are now is the way that they've always been. They, all things continue the same from the beginning. They're, they're denying the flood. And unfortunately, in our day, we're kind of trained to think that way, too, that the way present processes are going is the way it's always been. And really, that's the philosophy behind uh, evolution, the billions of years. That's called uniformitarianism. Yeah, and and uh, we had your colleague, uh, Dr. Snelling, on uh, for a, a couple of years ago to talk about the geology of the world and how it's explained by the flood, a catastrophic processes. Now, Tim, what I would like you to do is just sort of talk about the animals a little bit. How many came on the ark and, you know, pairs and sevens and all that other kind of thing? Um, all right, yeah, in Genesis 6, it tells us that two of every kind would come to Noah. And then in the next chapter, God uh, elaborates or clarifies and said that there would be seven or seven pairs of the clean animals and the flying creatures. Now, some people think that that means just the clean flying animals, and some people think it's all of the flying animals. But then some Bibles will say seven pairs rather than just seven. And the reason for that is the Hebrew language literally states seven, seven, a male and his female. Well, should that be interpreted as seven or seven pairs? And the the Bibles we have today are kind of split 50-50 on that. What we had to do is make a decision at the Ark Encounter. Every time we had a choice between a lower number and a higher number for the animals, we always went with the higher number because we're trying to show how could these fit on the ark. And if we always picked a lower number, somebody would accuse us of cheating. Yeah. Uh, so when you do that, and, and again, we're dealing with animal kinds, not different species. You know, so when, when you think about dogs today, you know, you've got your common dogs, but then you've got wolves and coyotes and dingoes and foxes. Those are all different species, and there's several different species of foxes. Those, those are all still part of the dog kind. So Noah just needs two dogs. You don't need two of every one of those things. And when you understand that principle, there are fewer than 1,400 kinds in, that Noah would have had to bring on board the ark. And that's including those that are still around today and those that have gone extinct since the time of the flood. And then uh, when, you, when you multiply that by two for all of the unclean animals and by 14, which is what we were using, you end up with fewer than, 60, fewer than 6,800 animals. I think it's 6,744 or something like that. And that's probably an overestimate based okay. on how we were doing things. Okay. Well, that's very good, Tim. So species and kinds, okay? And there's a big difference between them. Today, we call them species. In the Bible, they're called kinds. Explain the difference and, and explain why the claim by skeptics, you know, they needed to fit millions of animals on the ark is an erroneous kind of conclusion. Yeah, and we've heard all sorts of numbers from the skeptics. You know, how could you possibly fit 10 million species, 12 million, 20 million, 80 million, 100 million? I've heard all of those numbers from people. And it's almost like they're just picking a number out of a hat, just trying to make it seem as absurd as possible. And what I want to get across is that what we're doing is people classify animals, you know, it's just a man-made convention. Is it, are, can we, you know, categorize them by color if we wanted to? Well, we could, but we don't. We, we do it by assumed relationships. And when we look at uh, today, we have our classification system where you've got your family, genus, and then species. And so what the skeptic often does is, well, how could you fit all these different species in the ark? And, and the fact is you don't have to. We've got, you know, dogs are maybe the easiest way to understand this. You've got a bunch of different species of dogs. So you've got the dingoes, wolves, the various types of wolves, uh, coyotes, various types of foxes. Those are, a lot of those are different species. And yet they're all members of the dog kind or the, the uh, Canidae, I think it is. Uh, so they're, they're all dogs. Noah doesn't have to bring two, you know, red foxes, two uh, wolves, two dingoes, two coyotes. He just needs to bring two dogs. And from that, you have the genetic variability to give uh, for all of the different uh, species that we see today. Uh, one of my colleagues, uh, Dr. Nathaniel Jeanson, has done a lot of research on that. And so uh, guests can look his name up on the Answers in Genesis website and, and find a lot more information about it. But once you understand that, that the, the, the kind is more roughly equivalent to what we would put as our family level. Now, it's not always at the family level, but roughly equivalent to the family level. Then you realize that this is not as difficult as what it seems at first. Yeah, you know, I mean, an analogy, and I'm not, I certainly would separate us from the animal kingdom, so I'm not making an evolutionary statement. We're different, but look at the variability in humanity. Look how different people are. Their height and, you know, you've dogs, you've got different sizes and shapes and colors and all that. Well, in humanity, you have that. You have Wilt Chamberlain and you have, uh, you know, seven foot two, Sha uh, Shaquille O'Neal, right, for sports fans out there, and a guy who rides, yep. a, rides a horse in the Kentucky Derby and everything in between, right? I mean, we wouldn't say that one of them is not human. 
Yeah, that's exactly right. God has created us with with incredible variability within our DNA, and the same thing's true for each of these kinds of creatures. And when you when you understand that Noah just had to bring the kinds on board the ark rather than the species, then this starts to make sense. And the other thing that often is left out in this discussion when they talk about 20 million or 100 million species or all of these, they're including every single marine creature. Noah doesn't have to bring the sea creatures. There's a pretty big pond outside the ark during the flood. Yeah. yeah. Um, he, he doesn't have to bring the, the single-celled organism. That includes every single cell organism we've ever identified, all the bacteria, all those things. He doesn't have to bring over a million species of insects. Uh, now, maybe he brought some of the more delicate ones like butterflies and moths, maybe bees. But for the most part, they don't fit the description of what had to go on board the ark, and insects can survive a flood. So when you eliminate all of those, and it also includes all of the plants that we've ever identified as well. So when you eliminate all of those, you're left with a, roughly 34,000 species of land animals that are required to go on board the ark. But again, we're not talking about species, we're talking about kinds, and that number is fewer than 1,400. Okay. Well, uh, when folks go visit the ark, they can read all about that and, of course, go on your website and get into particulars of that. But um, So we're going we're gonna to ask a, a related question. This would be fun because it relates to paradigms, and that is, you know, what about kangaroos and penguins? Maybe you could address that kind of question. It's a very natural question. I think it's a logical one. Are you asking how did they get to where they are today? Uh, well, I guess we could we could take it that way. I was thinking too, you know, because people would think, you know, oh, penguins live in cold weather and they live in Antarctica and how to, oh, yeah. how does all this work? You know, take it any way you want, Tim. I'll let you go with it. Yeah, well, let's, penguins also live in the zoos in the United States. Uh, they don't yeah. have to be really cold. They just happen to be able to thrive yes. in the cold. Uh, same thing with polar bears. You know, they don't have to live in the Arctic region. They we I've seen them in zoos in the United. I've seen them in the San Diego Zoo. It was pretty warm that day. Yeah, uh, yeah. So they they don't have to be in cold weather. So th that's one of the uh, mistakes that people make is they assume that the way they see an animal take well that must be the only way they could survive. As far as um, we believe, there's one continent on the Earth prior to the flood, so yes. there's no difficulty of getting animals from dif distant regions to the ark itself. Uh, but one of the things the skeptic asks is how could you get kangaroos you know or koalas to australia um during you know after the flood because we don't find any fossils of them from the middle east all the way to australia well part of the reason for that is because the only way you get fossils is if something is buried rapidly you know if a creature dies out in the field and just sits there for a while it's not it's going to decay it's not going to fossilize yes and the thing about marsupials which is interesting is that they can actually travel much faster than most creatures because the the females get to carry their young in a pouch for a long time. They don't have to slow down as a newborn is is there and, and protect them and you know stay in the same area for a while till the newborn can get moving pretty quickly. So marsupials can keep on going. Um, but there is evidence that, that there were some between the Middle East and uh, Australia as well. But there's different methods for how they would have gotten there. You know, Some people think that maybe it was a land bridge because during the post-flood ice age, which that's a different topic to get into altogether, <laughs> yes, um, yes. the water levels would have been lower, and so you could have reached many places on Earth. But with uh, some of the Australian animals, it seems like rafting is a, a more viable option, which sounds strange to people, but if you have a worldwide flood that's going to rip all of this vegetation off the Earth's surface, it's a lot of those are going to be, a lot of that vegetation is going to be floating like you see in Spirit Lake today because of Mount St. Helens 40 years ago, you have these large log mats and vegetation mats that they could have been the size of like the state of Delaware or something. And you could have animals on there that would go from one place to another without even realizing they're on, yeah. they're on a raft. And then when it, it touches to, you know, to Australia, they get off and inhabit that. Well, that's good. That's good. You know, those are some legitimate ideas to explain how all this happened. We don't have eyewitness testimony of it, but it, it certainly makes sense and it's not, unfeasible. So here's a paradigm question. Uh, we, we believe that the creation is recent and the flood destroyed the whole, the world that then was. So what about the dinosaurs? I'll let you have at it. All right. Um, in terms of were they on the ark, you know, when, when people think of that, they think, oh, that's ridiculous. First of all, most people think, well, no, they lived millions of years ago. They didn't need to have them on the ark. In fact, we we get that reaction from some people who come through the Ark Encounter because they're not expecting to see dinosaurs on there, and yet we show some uh, of the dinosaur kinds within some of the various cages in the Ark. And so they're surprised by that, and sometimes they're upset by that. But uh, if, again, it is a different paradigm. Are we going to take God at his word? And if we do, then we see that God created this world recently, all of the creatures and, and man, you know, recently. 
And that would mean the dinosaurs as well. Uh, in fact, they were made on the same day that man was, day six. Uh, and originally they were created vegetarian. Genesis 1.29 tells us Adam and Eve were originally vegetarian. Then Genesis 1.30 tells us the animals were as well. So when people get this idea about dinosaurs in the ark, their first objection is, well, they lived millions of years ago. Well, that's a different discussion. We, we can we can get into that. There's a lot of evidence that, that there were dinosaurs up until not too uh, long ago in our, in our past. Uh, there, there are all sorts of things we could look at for that. But um, about whether they were on the ark or could they fit on the ark, uh, what happens is a lot of times people will think of like the biggest dinosaurs, you know, your Brachiosaurus or Argentinosaurus, some, some of these things that are 100 feet long and, you know, 50 to 70 tons, just these massive creatures. And they think there's no way you could put those on the ark. Well, even the biggest ones were once a lot smaller. <laughs> you know, they, they were when they were the, an egg, they were about the size of a football. After they hatched, they're not all that much bigger. Yeah. And so it makes sense for Noah to bring juveniles uh, or smaller varieties within a kind. Uh, remember, we were talking about kinds before. Uh, so some, sometimes you have a larger species, sometimes you have a pretty small species within that kind. Yeah. And so as long as you have two representatives of that kind, a male and female, then it it that's all you got to do. But with the dinosaurs, it makes sense to bring the younger ones or the smaller ones. Why? They, they take up less space. They eat less. They have less less waste. So you don't have to clean up after them as much. Um, the younger variety are going to be uh, more durable. So if you're getting bounced around in the stormiest seas that have ever been, you might fall over once in a while. You don't want to bring the oldest ones around that are going to break a leg or a rib or something every time they fall over. And another important reason is the younger ones will have many more years to reproduce after the flood. Yeah, that, that makes total sense. In fact, I've never thought about the reproduction part of it before until you just bring it up now. I mean, that's that's just logical. And of course, you know, God is the eternal creator. He's the one that sent the animals to Noah. So he would have sent exactly the right ones for the right purpose that would have been able to reproduce. So, you know, we have to keep that in the back of our mind. I mean, the text doesn't say that, but it's a reasonable inference from it. God knew what he was doing when he was making this plan. Yeah. Right. He told Noah how big the ark would need to be. He's the one sending the animals. And when we ran all the calculations about how much food, how much water, all of those different things and how much space the animal take up, once you know it, everything fits just right. Yeah. Now, speaking of plans, the natural question is, right along the lines, what you're talking about is how could they have cared for these animals uh, on the ark for, the whole, for a, a little bit over a year? Why not, let's address that a little bit. Yeah, well, we had a philosophy of, of working efficiently rather than working harder. I mean, I'm sure the people, all eight people on board the Ark were working hard, but if if you think about like a hamster uh, setup today, you know, the, the cage or the, the tank, that, not tank, but the little enclosure that you got for a hamster or gerbil, you can dump a bunch of food in that tube or a bunch of water in, the, in, in their water tank and leave it alone for a week or two. It's not like you have to go by and feed it every single day and, and do all this work and clean it out every single day. And so the way we set up the cage system at the Ark Encounter is very similar to something like that, where for most of the animals, you don't have to feed them every day. You, you can handle it once a week or maybe twice a week, depending on what kind of animal it is. Uh, the same thing's true with the waste. We've got the floors um, almost like a, a bamboo slotted floor, so the waste could drop through that onto a ramp that would go down to the bottom of all these enclosures. And you just have to clean out the very bottom tray there rather than all of every single individual stall or individual Yes. Uh, enclosure. So with, with something like that, as far as how you house them, how you feed them, how you get them enough water, you can do that pretty efficiently. And, and a lot of the techniques we were looking at were things that farmers had used in the 1700s, the 1800s, uh, before a lot of the rise of modern machinery. Yes. Yeah, so, so, so yeah, in the ark, you see that when you go visit, you can see these mechanisms that you guys, now we don't know again from the text of scripture, but certainly Noah and his sons would have been very capable of designing uh, these kind of systems that work, would work efficiently. I like your hamster analogy. It just boils it down to, to a very simple one. How about fresh water, Tim? Uh, how did they, how did they, would they have uh, been able to get fresh water if they were in the open seas? Yeah, that's a good question because obviously they can't just, you know, drop a bucket down and scoop out a bunch of seawater. That's not going to help as far as drinking water, but there would be a lot of rain during that time. And so if they were to capture it, you know, use a system where whatever's falling on the roof is captured, uh, we actually ran some calculations based on the size of the roof. You would need uh, one inch of rain per week, which is about the same thing we get here in this area of Kentucky um, each year. You need one inch of rain per per week in order to keep all of the cisterns full, all of the, the water tanks and everything. But they also could have brought enough potable water for the whole thing as well. So there's a couple yeah. different options for that. 
Yeah, I mean that that makes total sense, and probably would have been a lot more rain than that. I, I assume what you're saying is you is you went tried to go with a a, a relatively conservative figure in the rain estimate. Yeah, that was the bare minimum of what, what they have needed. And obviously, during the initial stages of the flood, you're getting way more than <laughs> one inch of, of rain per week. I'm just saying, here's what they would have needed to keep all of the tanks full and, yes. and everything they need. So I think we started with an estimate of three months worth of supply that they would have started with. Okay. And then just keep that full. All right. That's excellent. Well, uh, maybe let's cover some other misperceptions about, about Noah and the Ark. You know, a great example would be, a great question would be, well, what, what kind of evidence is outside the Bible for the flood? I mean, is, is the whole world silent about this event? What do we find? Well, you mentioned that uh, a couple of years ago you had an interview with Dr. Andrew Snelling. I'm sure he could tell you all about the geology that, you know, those rock layers that we see. Uh, the vast majority of them are evidence of the worldwide flood. They're laid down by water. You've got all sorts of, you know, millions and millions and millions of fossils. But this is all exactly what you'd expect to find if there was a worldwide flood. And we find those things across continents. You see the same rock layer uh, in the Grand Canyon. You can see that same one up in uh, Wisconsin. You can see that over in Israel. You can see it in Africa. So it's the same rock layer, meaning that it was laid down at the same time. Yeah. Uh, that's across continents. Uh, so there's just from uh, from geology, you have that. But uh, you also have evidence from, you know, thing, from uh, cultural evidence. So the different uh, flood accounts that you find or flood legends from around the globe, hundreds of them. Uh, in fact, I know I read over 200 of them just for the uh, the exhibit on deck three of the Ark, we've got one called Flood Legends. And oftentimes they're very similar in, in certain details to the flood account. They talk about one righteous man or one favored family who the gods, you know, warned about the coming flood. They had to build a raft or a boat or a canoe or an ark and uh, bring the animals on board. And then they survived this flood that wiped out the world. And then they started over. And uh, sometimes they even mention a rainbow in the sky at the end. And so there's a lot of similarities, but then there's also very distinct differences. Sometimes they, they sound really bizarre, some of the things that were going on there. But that's really what we'd expect to find, given what the Bible tells us, that in Genesis chapter 11, God confuses their language at Babel, and people scatter, and they take that history that they had up until that point with them. In fact, it's not just flood legends we find everywhere. The reason man becomes bad in most of these cultures is it almost always has something to do with a serpent or a fruit tree. That's all over the place. We yeah. find that all over the globe. Uh, sometimes they have similar creation myths. A man was made from the dust of the ground and then the great spirit came and made him alive or the, the, this wind blew and, and man came to life. Uh, and so you find these similarities of Genesis 1 through 11 throughout all of these cultures around the globe. And yet from Genesis 12 onward, there's no more similarities. Well, that's a great testimony that what we're told in Genesis 11 is accurate and that they did scatter at that time. And the flood is the one that is by far the most common, and because that's something that would have left such a dramatic impact in, in their minds as they scattered. And so that was passed down from generation to generation. You get some distortion along the way, yes. but that kernel of truth is still there. Yeah, you know, it's interesting too, Tim, because I've read people try to explain that by, you know, eh, there was some local event, some cataclysmic local event, and that was the sort of kernel of the story, and then it went out into the world. But boy, I tell you, I find, you know, a local flood can certainly be a folklore for the local people. They'll remember that. They'll, they'll tell their kids and stuff. But across the globe, uh, that just doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Maybe you could talk a little bit more about some, some examples from around the world, uh, different cultures that you're aware of. Yeah, so you're right. There are, there are times where perhaps a local flood could explain certain details. But how come in one of the Canadian legends, one of the native tribes from Canada, you have at the end, they, you know, the family sends a couple of creatures off the ark to find out how deep the water is. You know, is it safe for us to go out yet? Well, that's very similar yes. to, you know, Noah sending the raven and the dove to find out if it's safe for us to go out yet. And you have other ones uh, like the Hawaiian legend where there's a rainbow afterwards. And you have all sorts of similarities a around the globe to the, the biblical account. So the, the idea of just local legends being the one to explain it or the way to explain this can explain the differences, but it can't explain the extreme similarities. The, the, how oftentimes it's only eight people. I mean, yeah. That, that you see that repeated multiple times. So uh, that's very similar that uh, unless you're just lucky once in a while, you're not going to have just eight people. Uh, so I think it's a, a much stronger argument or a much stronger conclusion that these things are all echoes of a real event. And, it, and we believe that Genesis gives us the real account, the real history, even though it's not the first one written down. 
you know, you have some of the ancient Babylonian or Sumerian accounts that probably were written before that one, but it doesn't mean that they're getting it right either. Yes. And the Bible is the only one that provides an ark that would actually survive the flood and keep its inhabitants safe. The rest of them, you know, a canoe is not going to do really good in a giant flood. Yes. And a little raft is not going to do really well. But uh, the or, ark is or the only a one cube. that works. I've seen them. Yeah, the, or the cube. The cube yeah, the cube one. could stay afloat. That's the epic of Gilgamesh. It would stay afloat, but it would rock so badly, it'd almost be like scrambled eggs by the time you're done there. Yeah. Yeah, the people wouldn't be able to, and the animals wouldn't be able to survive. You know, it's fascinating, too. I've read in the literature, I've read the ancient Near Eastern, uh, uh, you know, flood stories, the Sumerian story. I mean, it goes. some of it goes back to 2000 BC, as far as we know. And it's really fascinating because you're reading the literature. You know, the, the scholars are like, well, this has to be from a common tradition. That's kind of how far they'll go with their, with their argument. They won't admit, well, this is a real event or they won't go, or the Genesis event is a real one, but it has to come from a common tradition. And, and I sit there and I go, yeah, it comes from the common tradition of the real event that happened. And that's how you explain it. Yeah, and, and I mentioned that the ark was the only one that would survive a flood. The other thing the Bible does that's, that's really unique is it doesn't use um, region-specific animals when it's talking about the creatures that were sent off. It uses things that, that aren't, you know, the, the flood accounts presumably written in Israel or as the Israelites are wandering in the wilderness that, that time by Moses. Um, he's not picking animals that were just local to that region as far as the raven and the dove. These are, uh, But the Canadian legend that I mentioned earlier, it's a beaver that they send off because it's the animals that they know. They pick a, a hill in their region that's one of the highest ones in their area where the ark lands. Well, the Bible doesn't do that either. It picks the mountains of Ararat, which are hundreds of miles from where Israel is. Yeah, that, that, that's great. Well, Tim, wrap it up and give a good word to the folks about the flood and the reliability of the account. All right, well, here's what I'll say. You can trust God's word from the very beginning to the very end, and that includes the creation account, the, the flood account in Genesis 6 through 9. That also includes what's going to happen at the end. Uh, but just as God judged the world one time with water, and that was uh, during the flood, he's going to judge this world again, and that time, this time it's going to be by fire. But he's provided a means of eternal salvation from our sins and from the penalty for that through his son, Jesus Christ. And uh, he died on the cross for our sins and rose from the grave. And you can learn more about all of those things at the Ark Encounter and go into much more detail. Uh, so thanks for tuning in. All right, Tim, thank you so much for, for sharing your expertise of this subject and encouraging the people of God. We love you, appreciate you. Thank you for joining us today. Hey, thanks, Henry, so much. I appreciate it. You can find more about the Ark Museum at arkencounter.com. And if you're ever passing nearby northern Kentucky, you can stop and check it out. Not quickly, though. It's like a whole day thing. Well, that's all we have for today. Until next time. Digging for Truth is a presentation of the Associates for Biblical Research. To find out more about ABR, just go to BibleArchaeology.org.